Salut tout le monde And welcome to Mr. This is Europe, and here's France. Now, allons-y, shall we? The first French, like every people, were hunters and gatherers, who, not like every people, painted plump horses and oxen and now extinct deer with enormous horns. The centuries slipped through the inexplicable ages of stone, where rows of rock and menhirs and granite dolmens were set up and no one knows why. In 600 BC, the Greeks established a settlement on the sea, which would become France's first city, known today as Marseille. The Greeks were not much interested in the rest of France, but the Celtic people were, and from the 5th century BC began expanding through almost all the nation's present territory. The Celts were not very accomplished architects, but they were first-rate metalsmiths, and there are few, if any, ancient peoples who could rival them in their exquisitely intricate craftsmanship. Celtic France became known as Gaul, and the various tribes of Gauls who inhabited it gained a reputation for being fierce fighters. In 387 BC, the Gauls under Brennus and his epic mustache sacked the city of Rome. They also invaded Greece and ended up carving out a slice of Anatolia for themselves. Now, the Romans never forgot their defeat by the Gauls and worked steadily to beat them back as their republic expanded. And it was Julius Caesar who hit them harder than ever before. The Gallic tribes were not united and Caesar crushed them one by one, though it was no picnic and the Gauls gave him a tough time, especially when the chief of the Arverni tribe, Vercingetorix, began uniting the Gauls and won against the Romans in battle. But it was too little too late and after Caesar's victory at Alesia, Vercingetorix surrendered. Caesar's conquest, according to Plutarch, left a million Gauls dead and another million enslaved. So Gaul became a Roman province and the Latin language spread and became the basis from which the French language would be born. Roman culture was readily adopted by the Gauls, particularly its wine. The French don't build temples anymore, like the Maison Carrée, but they never got over the vino. Water, however, is more crucial for life, and to supply it to the city of Nîmes, the Romans built this incredible aqueduct bridge, the Pont du Gard. But even mighty Rome couldn't last forever, and after ruling several centuries in Gaul, they eventually could not stop the invading Germanic tribes who poured in and conquered it. One of the tribes was called the Franks, and France gets its name from them. The Frankish tribes were united by Clovis, who adopted Christianity and began the Merovingian dynasty. Long-haired bellicose kings who, after the reign of Dagobert, lost their power to high officials known as mayors of the palace. One of these mayors was Charles Martel, who defeated the Muslim invasion in 732 at the Battle of Tours. Martel's son, Pepin the Short, officially took control in 751 and thus began the Carolingian dynasty, whose most famous monarch was Charlemagne. Called the father of Europe, Charlemagne conquered and united, and after being crowned by Pope Leo the third in the year 800 became the first emperor in Western Europe since the fall of Rome. After the reign of Louis the Pious, the empire split in three. The Vikings besieged Paris in the 880s. During the reign of Charles the Fat, a bunch of them settled here and became the Normans, who would end up conquering England. But before that, in 987, Hugues Capet took power, whose house would rule till 1328. The Capet kings were pretty weak to begin with, but bit by bit boosted their power, and it wasn't easy. For one thing, you had this place over here, Anjou. The Angevin nobility grew stronger through strategic marriages, and even gained the throne of England with Henry II in 1154. Who knows how powerful they may have become, had not John of England lost most of his French lands after Francis Philip II won the Battle of Bovines in 1214. Still, the fact that French nobles ruled in England meant that for a long time English kings would claim French clay. Anyhow, the Middle Ages went on, the peasants in their feudal fields, travelling troubadours singing songs of courtly love, crusaders and cathedrals. The Gothic style that spread all over medieval Europe was born in France, where some of its finest examples stand from Bourges and Amiens to Chartres and Reims. The magnificent Saint-Chapelle in Paris was built by the much-loved Louis IX, whose strong religious faith and charity towards the poor and push for peace in Christian lands saw him canonized as a saint in 1297. Philip the Fair was not very fair in unjustly suppressing the Order of the Knights Templar, but he needed their money, so he didn't care. Anyway, his sons all left no heir, and the crown passed to another relative, and thus the House of Valois took power. But there was a closer relative on the throne of England called Edward III, and he claimed the French crown in 1337. And so the Hundred Years' War began, and it didn't look good for the French at the outset, with the English crushing the French in battles like Auberoche and Crécy. Then the Black Death tore into France, wiping out a huge chunk of the population, and then the English won again at the Battle of Poitiers. Fortune returned to France under Charles the Wise, and most conquered lands were regained. But then England's Henry V invaded and smashed the French at Agincourt in 1415, while the French king, Charles the Mad, believed he was made of glass. 
France. It looked as though England was destined to rule France. But then a little peasant girl from Don Rémy had visions of saints who told her to kick the English out. Of course, she was Joan of Arc, and her presence at the siege of Orléans inspired the French victory. More successes followed, and though she ended up captured and burned at the stake, it was too late. The French morale and spirit were rekindled, and they went on to win the war under Charles VII, and France was saved. The Renaissance in France led to an overflowing of culture, humanism, and grandiose chateaux and tender chansons, all amid bloodshed in the Italian wars and persecution of Protestants. The French wars of religion saw some three million people killed, finally ending with good King Henry IV, the first king of the House of Bourbon. Henry passed the Edict of Nantes, which promoted tolerance. Meanwhile, the French began exploring and colonizing the New World, and ended up controlling a big slice of the Americas. Under Louis XIII, the real power was held by the clever Cardinal Richelieu, who labored day and night to strengthen the absolute power of the crown. And our oh boy did that succeed for the next king, Louis XIV, called the Sun King, a vain and proud patron of the arts, who flaunted his splendor from his sumptuous palace at Versailles. But glory for Louis was best found in battle, and France became the most powerful nation in Europe. Scientific and philosophical endeavors bloomed in his reign, but it was during the reign of the not-so-splendid Louis XV that the world-changing movement called the Enlightenment began. French philosophers like Voltaire, Montesquieu, Denis Diderot, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau began promulgating radical theories and ideas, stressing reason, empiricism, individual rights and freedoms, and challenging the institutions of church and king. From salons to street corners, these dangerous new ideas swept through the nation. Change was in the air. France was in debt from war, the common people were suffering under taxes, and bad harvests saw people starving, and popular resentment of the powdered dainty nobility set the societal simmer into a boil, and the French Revolution began. Paris erupted into a raging rebellion, weapons were seized, and the Bastille, a fortress prison and symbol of regal tyranny, was stormed and news of the insurrection spread. The monarchy was abolished, and the French Republic proclaimed. Then it all got out of hand, and the thirst for the blood of the aristocrats and other state enemies saw the guillotine wheeled out, and some 17 thousand people beheaded, including King Louis XVI and his queen Marie Antoinette, during what's called the Reign of Terror. The chaos and anarchy and warfare France was engulfed in couldn't go on, and one man stepped up to take control, a Corsican who had distinguished himself in the Revolutionary Wars, and who, in 1799, seized power as first consul. Of course, he was Napoleon Bonaparte. His grip on power was solidified, and in 1804 he was crowned emperor, and Europe quivered. Austria, Britain, and Russia formed the Third Coalition and declared war on Napoleon, and failed as French forces thrashed the enemy in the Battle of Austerlitz. So the Fourth Coalition was launched, and Napoleon smashed it. And so the Fifth Coalition was launched, and Napoleon triumphed again. Bonaparte conquered much of Europe, and passed numerous reforms from education to law. But it was on the battlefield that his legend was forged, and it was battle that proved his downfall. In 1812, Napoleon invaded Russia with over 600,000 troops, and while he won at Borodino and torched Moscow, the Russians refused to surrender, and continued to attack, and the winter set in, and the food ran out, and as he retreated, Napoleon's decimated Grande Army was grand no more. The Sixth Coalition finally defeated Napoleon and exiled him, but in 1815 he escaped and the French rallied to his side in the Hundred Days, until the Battle of Waterloo saw him defeated once and for all, and banished way over here, never to return. The House of Bourbon was restored with King Louis XVIII, but when Charles X became tyrannical, he was overthrown in the July Revolution and replaced with his cousin, Louis Philippe, who pushed for colonial endeavors in Africa that saw France conquer Algeria and later a lot more of the continent. Now, France had been modernizing during the Industrial Revolution, but the challenges all this caused, alongside the government's hesitance to pass reforms, led to the 1848 revolution, which installed Napoleon's nephew, Napoleon, as first president. In 1852, he became emperor and oversaw more modernization and economic growth, but underestimated the might of the Prussians under Bismarck, who sought to unify the German states. In the Franco-Prussian War, France was whipped by the Germans, who took this bit of land. Though humiliated, a time of peace and recovery ensued called La Belle Époque, a time of impressionist painters, elegant fashions, and scientific advancement. The Eiffel Tower was built, and if you like movies, thank the French, as they invented cinema. But when World War I started, France went to war against Germany, eager to restore its honor. After intense fighting in battles like the Marne and Verdun, and after losing over a million men, the French were victorious, took that land back, and were not at all merciful towards the Germans in the aftermath, demanding massive reparations in the harsh Treaty of Versailles, and even invading at one point to bully them a bit. Now, of course, the Germans were not happy. Some of them really not happy. Yes, Germany recovered and became exceedingly strong. When Hitler invaded France in World War II, he conquered it very quickly. The government agreed to an armistice, though the resistance didn't, and France remained under German occupation until liberated by the Allies following the Normandy landings on D-Day 1944. After the war, France began to recover, but shaky times arose as its colonies demanded independence. Stability and strength of leadership were had with President Charles de Gaulle.
Gaulle, who oversaw decolonization and France becoming a nuclear power. Over the years, many people from former French colonies would emigrate to France. Massive protests flared up in 1968, symbolizing the country's transition to secularization, and the nation was a founding member of the EU. France today is one of the richest countries in the world, with a very high level of human development, and is the most visited nation in the world, receiving over 80 million tourists a year. France has contributed massively to humanity in art, in literature, in science, in fashion, in food, in music, in cinema, and in sport. Not bad for a country that looks at this and thinks, yummy. What sits ahead for France? Comment below, but for now, au revoir!